Welcome to this session of the Millbank Tweet Forum, uh, which is also being live streamed on the Just Security blog. My name is Ryan Goodman. I'm a professor here at NYU Law School and also co-editor-in-chief of the Just Security blog. And uh, we're very fortunate to have with us today Harold Coe, who's spending the semester here at NYU. And we could not have timed the event more perfectly uh, since the president just this morning has uh, submitted to Congress uh, his proposal for uh, Congress to authorize the use of military force against the Islamic State. Uh, so I thought just to first briefly introduce uh, Harold and uh, then to start us off uh, with the title of the topic of what is the forever war, uh, but then we'll jump actually to some of the nitty gritty of the President's proposal, uh, since I think that's on many people's minds. Uh, Harold Code deserves no introduction, or does not deserve no introduction, it requires no introduction. <laughs> Um, and uh, by way of example, there's actually a, I have a concrete example. When I uh, taught my, I'm teaching a class on international humanitarian law this semester. At the very first class, just to get a sense of the students' background knowledge, I run through about 15 people's names and ask them to raise their hand if they've heard of that name before, if they could actually tell me something about the person. Uh, Harold Coe's name was the only one in which every student in the class <laughs> had raised their hands. So really, uh, requires no introduction. Um, that said, uh, Harold is the Sterling Professor of International Law at Yale Law School. He was the former dean at Yale Law School. Um, I think of him, and many people think of him, as a national treasure. Uh, he is the one of the nation's most brilliant and influential public servants. He served for four years as the legal advisor in the, uh, in the State Department, in the Obama administration, for three years as the Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor in the Clinton administration and for two years in the Office of Legal Counsel of the Justice Department in the Reagan administration. He's responsible for having uh, played a principal, if not the lead role, in theorizing and litigating uh, the major area in which uh, human rights uh, issues are raised in the United States courts under the Alien Tort Statute and the, Tor and the Torture Victim Protection Act, uh, for litigating some of the most profound public interest uh, cases to the Supreme Court, including representing Cuban and Haitian refugees for which a movie is made about Harold and that litigation. Um, he also received for that kind of work a Trial Lawyer of the Year Award, uh, but besides that is also a consummate academic, written, having written one of those important books um, on national security and the separation of powers, having played a pioneer role in um, the area of law that is uh, at the interdisciplinary boundaries between international law and international relations. He is beloved by his current and former students. I know I happen to be one of them. Um, so it's really a joy uh, to have Harold with us uh, for the semester and uh, for this particular forum. Uh, so Harold, I thought um, I'd start out uh, at the beginning um, in which after you left the Obama administration, um, we found, I think it's the very first public statement, public address that you made. You went to Oxford, the Oxford Union, and the title of your speech was in May 2013, was How to End the, the Forever War. Six months earlier, uh, the Defense Department's general counsel, serving as general counsel at the time, Jay Johnson, had addressed uh, the Oxford Union, and the title of his speech was The Conflict Against Al-Qaeda and Its Affiliates, How Will It End? Um, subsequent to that address, you also gave a progress report about six months later and then, and then a year in. And the progress report seemed to suggest uh, that we were uh, making progress. Um, and to this morning kind of uh, raises the question, uh, because you also seem to suggest that the decisions that are made at this point in time with respect to authorization of force against ISIL might actually mean that we're back in the forever war or that we turn away from it. So just to open us up, could you describe what you mean by the forever war and where you think we are with it today? Uh, so, well, first of all, thank you for all those nice words. Uh, it's great to be here at NYU. I have a number of NYU neckties, but unfortunately I didn't wear any of them. But <laughs> come to my class and I'll wear some of them for you. Uh, it's a friendly and uh, wonderful environment and I'm uh, thrilled to be here. Um, what do we mean by the forever war? Uh, it was the armed conflict with Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces that began uh, after September 11th. And it is now the longest running armed conflict in US history, and has been for some time. And the 2001 authorization for the use of military force has been in existence on an open-ended basis 
and is increasingly being construed to reach groups that didn't exist on 9-11, are far away from uh, the zones and uh, areas of turmoil on 9-11. Uh, and so the question is what to do about that. And uh, my colleague, Jay Johnson, who's now the Secretary of Homeland Security, had given a speech uh, where he said, uh, there comes a tipping point where uh, a war can end because you've defeated the enemy. Uh, and the reason why that speech was cleared within the US government is everybody agreed that there could be a tipping point and some people thought it was never, <laughs> and other people thought it was tomorrow. <laughs> so the statement, there is a tipping point, doesn't tell you much. So the real question is, how do you bring this forever war to an end? Uh, now, first of all, I should say I you know, um, have great respect for the administration. I work for the administration. I wish it success. Uh, and uh, what they had tried to do uh, was to narrow what was called an open-ended war on terror into a specific fight against a, a particular network, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces. So I think what Ryan is driving at is that we are at a moment of tension between two objectives. Uh, it's very clear that President Obama would like to leave office, uh, and that moment is closer and closer, saying he ended wars. Uh, when he ent you know, first of all, he's an anti-war candidate, uh, when he leaves the government, he'd like to say that he uh, ended the war in Iraq, which he opposed, uh, that he ended war in Afghanistan, and that he's brought to a successful end the war against al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces. Uh, the problem is uh, the ISIL um, is a threat, uh, and people can argue about the causes of the growing threat, uh, which is in many ways um, uh, overtaken al-Qaeda as a threat. Uh, and so he's now in the very awkward position that uh, we're still fighting in Iraq, except now against ISIL, that um, uh, while there's an end to the combat mission in Afghanistan, um, we're still fighting in Afghanistan, and we're still fighting against uh, groups closely associated with al-Qaeda, like the Nusra Front and the Khorasan Group and others. And so um, the bill that was sent up today, or the proposal that was sent up today to be put into a bill, cuts against the thrust of what the president wants to do. Um, but his first obligation, as he says, and I agree, is to defend uh, national security. So he's got to actually have a legal authority that helps him to do the job that he wants to do. Nobody thinks that ISIL is anything but an outrageous group, as they've demonstrated by beheading people, burning them in cages, uh, killing journalists, uh, all kinds of outrageous things that have even shocked al-Qaeda. So uh, that's a pretty tough standard there. Um, so then uh, number two, given that uh, this has happened, that he's introduced this legislation, uh, can he return to his original goal of ending the forever war? Now. Uh, shortly I gave, after I gave the speech at uh, Oxford, the president gave a speech at the National Defense University in May 2013 where he explicitly embraced the goal of ending the forever war. Um, and uh, what he said, which was absolutely correct, is that perpetual war is distorting of human rights, it's distorting of democracy, and we should endeavor to bring it to an end. And that that is still his hope, and in particularly he hopes to uh, uh, refine, modify, and ultimately repeal the 2001 authorization for the use of military force. So given these two competing objectives, the question today is, did the proposal that was sent up, uh, which uh, is supposed to, on the one hand, authorize them to fight ISIL and degrade and defeat it, um, also keep us on the path to ending the war down the road? Now, uh, Ryan, and I, again, I compliment um, uh, the Just Security, which is a blog that is really Ryan's brainchild, uh, I think has regularly committed the most uh, interesting uh, analysis of these issues. I, I urge you all to read it, or because it's here at NYU, you can work for it. You should read it every day. Uh, it's, in fact, the only blog that I read other than the Boston Red Sox daily blog. <laughs> 
So that's saying something. <laughs> and um, uh, I think that the uh, goal was to try to get some focus on this which uh, was done by um, a, a series of principles that we, a group of us, issued. It turned out that uh, uh, Ryan and Steve Vladek, who are the co-editors of Just Security, uh, joined that with another group uh, who is known to be uh, on the more conservative side, principally Jack Goldsmith of Harvard, and proposed these principles. A key to this is sunsetting of existing authorizations. So right now, the president could claim to fight ISIL on a number of different bases. Uh, he, he's claiming to fight it under the 2001 AUMF, under what has been called the splinter theory, or what I've called in the Just Security blog, a, a common DNA theory. Uh, and that's a problem, because common DNA can take you a long way. And there'll be many, many groups that have common DNA. Um, and um, uh, when I was in the government, people would say, so-and-so is an Al-Qaeda sympathizer. Well, you know, what does that mean? Uh, that doesn't mean they're a co-belligerent. That doesn't mean that they have merged with Al-Qaeda. It's like saying someone's a Beatles imitator. There's a lot, <laughs> as you know. Um, <laughs> There are a lot of Beatles imitators, but there are only four Beatles, and uh, two of them are dead. <laughs> so um, it should be that the goal is to bring the authorization against the group against whom we declared war in September 2001 to an end, and if there's a new enemy, declare a new war against that group in particular, because the goal should be to have democratic input into every um, new war that's being waged. That's certainly what's done when you're declaring war against a foreign country. So why should it be different uh, if it's um, uh, a, a uh, terrorist network? Um, so that's one basis. Because it was still going on in Iraq, in some circles they cited the old Iraq AUMF, the 2002 AUMF. Uh, the administration has never formally abandoned the constitutional theory, the Article II theory. So if you add this in, there will actually be four bases of authority to conduct wars, which doesn't look like you're bringing a war to an end. That means that this new authorization ideally should terminate, sunset, or set the basis for uh, the elimination of some of these other grounds of authority to update it. And what our group proposed was that the 2001 AUMF be sunsetted, that the 2002 AUMF be sunsetted, and that it be very, made very explicit that whatever new authority is put forward is, this, is the sole basis uh, of authority on which the president is proceeding against uh, ISIL. Um, the text of the provision that was sent up today does not include that. Uh, our group, having gotten rid of this, sent a letter the other day again saying, we really do think you need to sunset this. Now, there are members of Congress who agree, principally Democratic members, which I think explains uh, what's going on here. Uh, after all, if they sunset this bill, suppose it's passed, it may not be, but if it's sunsetted in 2018, it could be the basis on which a Republican president continues to battle, and a Republican Congress, which is uh, what we now have, doesn't want to tie the hands of a future Republican president by uh, restricting that person's authority. But they, by the way, have much less concern about the issue of a forever war. Um, and you hear this much less uh, articulated by this. So we're now entering a legislative process, uh, which I think will play out for some time. At the moment, we're in an awkward situation and that the president, under his own theory, has the power to fight ISIL under the 2001 AUMF forever and to fight them with ground troops if he deems it appropriate. So he has a belt and this is proposing a three-year set of suspenders. If it doesn't get passed, he's still got the belt. And um, so the real question is why should anybody vote for this? Um, the Republicans probably prefer the old AUMF and don't necessarily feel like taking responsibility for the ISIL-specific AUMF. Uh, and the Democrats, if they vote for it without a sunset, will simply be giving additional authority when they're more interested in ending the war. 
So I think there's a lot um, yet to come. Uh, there will be hearings on this bill. Administration witnesses will be called. This will happen after the congressional recess, which is coming up shortly. Um, and we'll see how serious it all is um, in a few weeks' time. Right. Um, so I guess one question is about the associated forces. Um, the, and as you described it, the, the president's theory is that the Islamic State is actually covered by the September 11th um, AUMF 2001 September uh, authorization to use force by Congress to deal with Al Qaeda. And then the theory is that the Islamic State is a successor to Al Qaeda or splintered off from it, um, which is something that you uh, criticized, but though you also said was legally defensible as a position. It would hold up in a court. Um, and was uh, within some sense of uh, reasonability, I would say. Um, though still very damaging because you don't want to be engaged in a long-term conflict under some, uh, when there's such a kind of cloud of concern about this legal theory. I guess one question is uh, how you think it might play out with respect to the particular proposal that the President put forward this morning. Uh, because the proposal itself, I would say one way of thinking of it is it's actually asking Congress to give its imprimatur to the theory. It's actually asking Congress to codify the theory into statute. Um, because the language that the President put forward is to say that the authorization that Congress would give the President to use force is not just against the Islamic State, uh, but its associated forces, which it defines then as individuals or organizations fighting for, on behalf of, or alongside ISIL, or any closely related successor entity. Um, so, in fact, asking Congress to go that next step and say that these authorizations would also apply to some kind of future unknown organization. Is, is that the way you see it? Is that, um, in particular, a kind of concern that you have? Or do you think that that's actually okay? Because uh, it was defensible but somewhat illegitimate under the 2001 IMF, but if Congress agrees, then we actually have democratic input and the people's representatives have chosen uh, to th give that kind of power to the president to kind of determine who uh, are successor organizations. Yeah, so those of you who have taken Ryan's class on uh, international humanitarian law know uh, that the reason to have um, uh, international humanitarian law is it knows you know who you're fighting against. And you know that you're fighting against a system of command and control. Uh, and you also know that in an extended war, you're not going to be fighting against people all the time who were fighting against you at the moment you declared the war. So an obvious example is if, we, if the US declares war against Japan on December 8th, 1941, uh, a Japanese soldier who joins the military a week uh, later and, and wasn't in um, the armed forces on December 7th uh, is still part of the enemy because they're part of the opposing force and they answer to command and control. And the concern is that they will follow orders. Now, when I was in the government, um, this was very much my focus. I was focused on who would follow an order from bin Laden to fly a plane into the United States buildings or some equivalent thing. Uh, it was not who hates America, because that's a very broad group, unfortunately. Uh, and that's not, uh, uh, that should not be the standard. Uh, and the way that this got massaged in the government was into the notion of uh, an associated force. Uh, and it became uh, a notion of co-belligerent, someone who is actually either formally or functionally merged with Al-Qaeda. Uh, so it would be the equivalent of uh, the government of Italy uh, making an alliance with Germany during World War II. Now, uh, Ryan has written an excellent blog challenging some of the theories by which this theory of co-belligerency developed, which is functional alliance. But it continues to be the theory of domestic law under which uh, the administration is proceeding. And the theory, which the piece of it which you have to sympathize with, is it, it can't be that ISIL, even though it calls itself a state, it's not a state, has some splinter group where the leaders don't agree with the leaders of ISIL but they all want to fight against the leadership of Iraq. And they also, by extension, hate the United States and would be happy to attack US soldiers. 
simply by the act of breaking away publicly, exempting themselves from uh, legal use of force. Uh, and I think that's what they're trying to get to. But I think the catch is this. Um, is this phrase in the new law actually putting the fight against ISIL on this statutory basis, or does it now create two bases? And you can just pick and choose. So if the president picks someone who's part of ISIL, he says, I'm fighting it under the statute and the 2001 AOMF. If you have a doubt, I'm actually fighting under the 2001. So I just have many methods of authority. I have belt and suspenders. Um, and uh, some in the administration appear to believe that the language is actually putting it on a narrower basis, although there's nothing in the text that says that it is. So that would be something to be tightened up. Um, after all, this is just a legislative proposal. Um, the real question is who will get behind this, how it will be passed, what will the vehicle for passing it be, et cetera. Right. Um, and notably, the press coverage has suggested that the White House proposal is similar in kind to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee's proposal that it adopted in December of last year in a democratically controlled uh, committee in Senate. Uh, but in fact, the Senate Committee's proposal had two things in it that the White House doesn't. Uh, one is it sunsetted the 2001 AUMF, which this one doesn't. And the second is it actually had a specific uh, provision in there, it's a section six, which says that the ISIL AUMF is the kind of the sole authority. It supersedes the 2001 authority for using force against the Islamic State so that it doesn't add any additional, um, and you can't do a kind of an end run around the ISIL AUMF by relying on the 2001. And then very conspicuously, uh, the president's proposal has neither of those two provisions. Um, so it really does seem like there's a very conscious effort to provide a lot of flexibility or wiggle room. So, um, so you make a very important point here, which is to put this in the context of the broader political landscape, uh, which is, uh, as you saw in the State of the Union address, that the president wants to show that he can govern with a majority Republican Congress in both houses. Um, and in his speech, uh, the State of the Union, he mentioned things that he thought that he could get legislative support for. Since the Senate Foreign Relations Committee minority passed their proposal with no Republican voting for it. They're moving to the right of that to try to pick up some Republican votes, particularly that of Senator Corker, who's the new chair of the Foreign Relations Committee. And what the administration is looking for is thinking there are enough senators who want to fight ISIL that we could do this even if we lose a fair number of Democrats. I think the real question is, though, is that the bill that you want? The, the bill that he could get support from for, uh, which many, some, some Democrats would oppose and House Democrats would oppose, is that actually the authorization that you support? Right. Um, so let me also just circle back on the question of the defensibility of the position that the Islamic State comes under the 2001 AUMF. So the theory is that, um, another way I think of it is if Japan broke up into two for some reason during World War II, but both of those entities still fought the United States, you'd th think the declaration of war would apply to both of them. Um, and that that kind of formal divide or disagreement between the two of them doesn't matter. But with the Islamic State, uh, to me, one of the concerns is not just the organizational structure as being different from Al-Qaeda Central, but rather that after the United States left Iraq, um, the organization, as then was called, never really attacked the United States. Um, even the President of the United States said that there was no threat of imminent attack um, against the United States from um, ISIL before U.S. engaged in airstrikes. And uh, some justifications that I've heard made um, are that the uh, beheadings and the like um, are kind of a justification because they beheaded American journalists, to which at that time, I think it was maybe the spokesperson for the White House that said that that was a, kind of an act against the United States. But all of that took place after the airstrikes. So one way of looking at it temporarily is after the United States left Iraq and under the Obama administration, the Iraq of Al, uh, uh, the Al Qaeda of Iraq, the organization that was formerly um, ISIL, didn't attack the US. They were concerned with regional issues. And then maybe also, obviously, against uh, the government in Baghdad. 
And, it's, uh, and at that point, one questions, well, if Japan broke up into two in World War II, but this one of the divisions said, okay, we're giving up on this. We've got other concerns, and we're no longer directing our hostilities against the United States. Then it's, it seems more complicated. And that, that one, I don't think, is so defensible. Um, because, in fact, the 2001 AUMF is um, authorizing a president and future presidents to use force against al-Qaeda, and let's even say it's offshoots, who are uh, directing hostilities against the United States. It's not an authorization to use force against splinter groups from al-Qaeda that want to uh, topple other governments around the world. Um, so those of you who want to go into the government, uh, one of the great, and, and also want to be professors, uh, one of the great um, difficulties of it is you suddenly find yourself doing things you never would do. Uh, for years, I've known the name of every one of my students. Um, and I meet them for that purpose. Uh, and for the four years I was in the government, I knew the name of every senior Al-Qaeda operative and their history. And they are your age. In fact, there was one guy who was born on the same day as my daughter, who was a student at NYU Business School. And I could actually track in his history what he was doing on particular days when my daughter was doing particular things. And this gives you a great sense of horror about the disparities of opportunity for people and why some people become so desperate that they think that their life should be spent flying planes into buildings and cutting people's heads off and things like that. Which also makes you realize, as John Kerry said the other day, the, the solution long term is not you can't kill people fast enough. It has to be a process of education and cultural outreach, et cetera. Going to this point, the theory which motivated this was the notion that Al-Qaeda, which was a cohesive, as terrorist groups go, organization split off into a number of sub-entities, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, AQIM, uh, East African Al-Qaeda, which ultimately went out of business, and Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda in Iraq, AQI, which uh, eventually morphed into some element of ISIL. And that's the sort of common uh, DNA theory. Now, Ryan has pointed to difficulties because you have to analyze this both under domestic law and under the law of war. But the blog I wrote for uh, Just Security pointed out simply this. Uh, in 1987, I wrote a law review article called Why the President Almost Always Wins in Foreign Affairs. And it's simply because uh, there will be a high degree of deference to the President's construction of his statutory and constitutional authorities uh, with regard to a threat in which he has information that nobody else has. And so there's a consistent pattern. The President acts, Congress obfuscates, and the courts defer. If someone tries to get into court, you argue there's no standing. If there is standing, it's a political question. If it's not a political question, it's not ripe. And if it's, <laughs> uh, and if it's not ripe, it's already moot. Uh, and then um, the Supreme Court in 1990, I'm sorry, I take it back, 1981, added to this in the Dames and Moore case, where it found under Youngstown Sheet and Tube Justice uh, uh, Jackson's concurrence that when you have a series of statutes in an area that roughly authorize a set of behaviors, it creates a general tenor of approval. Now, as opposed to saying if there's no specific statute, it falls into Jackson category three, you're saying that if there are a bunch of statute, it goes up to Jackson category one. Which means you're not gonna get this declared illegal under a parsing of the theory of the kind that Ryan just laid out, even if Ryan is correct. Um, this, by the way, was the heart of the problem because the president, I know, would have preferred to get this authorization when he still had a Democratic Senate. Mm. And what I'm advised, I don't know if it's true or not, but it sounds plausible to me, is that they even sent representatives from the White House to the Hill and were told, do not bring this to us before the midterm election. Why? Because we don't want to lose the Senate and the House to the Republicans, which they did. <laughs> so it's ironic they didn't send it. 
Therefore, they went under this backup theory, the splinter theory, common DNA theory. Having done that, a lot of people might conclude, well, you're fighting the war on your own. You're interpreting the statute. Why should we give you new authorization? Mm -hmm. And by the way, that continues to be the problem that he faces now from both sides. He's fighting the war on his own. It's Obama's war. Uh, why not let him um, fight it with the authorities that he's claimed? And just because he now, after the fact, in a different Congress, which is even more hostile to him, wants fresh authority, why should you give it to him? And I think it was that fear that led them not to put in a sunset. Mm. Because they thought, well, if we put in a sunset, that'll drive off even more people who think that this will uh, tie the hands of a future President Jeb Bush or um, whoever else might be a Republican candidate for president. Um, so one other element in the proposal is the question of reporting requirements. And in some sense, it's overlooked. It's not even talked about in a lot of the media that covers it. Uh, but the question is, do you think how much, of, how much of that do you think can solve or manage some of these other kinds of concerns or risks? So the idea here is, um, in, the, in the principles that we uh, wrote together, the thought is that there should also, in any kind of authorization, be a requirement that Congress says, because we're authorizing these powers, uh, you should also, as the administration, report to us on your exercise of our authority. Um, and the reports could include anything from um, what geographic areas US forces are operating in, who the associated forces are, um, and then you have even pushed the envelope uh, nicely, I would, I would say, to questions of uh, rates of civilian casualties and the like. So at one level, the first question is, um, do you think that solves some of the problems we're talking about with respect to associated forces? Because yes, the administration and whoever occupies the Oval Office next can have their theory of what is an associated force and what facts are required to meet that standard. But if we or the, Amer the American public or the Congress is actually told about that, we're in a different situation. Right now, there is no reporting under the 2001 AUMF. Um, and similarly, in terms of shared responsibility between the two branches, one might think that it's actually in the White House's interest to send a proposal that has reporting requirements in it. Because then it's kind of like, we told you so, or you shared some of the decisions that we're making. But the reporting provision um, is one sentence. It just says, uh, the president shall report to Congress at least once every six months on specific actions taken pursuant to this authorization. So is there, is there, is there an area in there that you think is, there's possible room to get something better in a final text? And, and what kind of goals do you think it's I mean, I, I think they can give more reporting. Um, for, first of all, the reporting requirements are not nothing. They, they force tremendous amount of discussion in the government about what to say. Uh, those of you who are in my human rights class, you know, it's what uh, my colleague Rebecca Ingber called an interpretation catalyst. You, you must do something. And people know how to read the reports. So even if they're very short, they're very meaningful. So journalists understand the, these reports. If they say something, they're very meaningful. Uh, the words you have not yet read out, enduring, what is it, enduring offensive? Enduring offensive combat operations. Enduring offensive combat operations. So uh, the proposal that the president sent up this morning doesn't say no ground troops. What, what's the exact wording? It's, it's no enduring offensive combat operations. So what's that all about? Uh, the obvious concern is um, they would send special forces. So people would be on the ground for a um, couple days, but it's not enduring offensive combat operations. The other possibility is if they're using drones, they have spotters on the ground who are painting targets with lasers and things like that. Uh, and so those people are on the ground, uh, but they are not themselves doing the operations. They are identifying targets for the drones to hit. So what ends up happening when you have a reporting requirement is in the interagency process, you have a meeting and somebody tells you there was an incident, here's what it was, how do we describe it? Hmm. Now the thing that I think is not gonna make this an effective thing ultimately for Congress is that the way that the executive branch has gotten around this over the past 15 years is they report all the time in classified settings to particular uh, members of Congress, 
and, and the congressmen love it. Uh, they, they love it. Uh, I, I don't know if you've been down to DC recently, but um, about 10 years ago, or eight, eight to 10 years ago, there was massive construction between uh, Capitol Hill and the Supreme Court, where they, the whole thing was torn up, and now it's all repaired. And it's ca called the uh, Visitor Center. Have any of you ever been in there? What is actually in there, in addition to some nice uh, uh, exhibits, et cetera, are a series of classified briefing rooms, SCIFs, as they're called, Secured Classified Information Facilities. And you go to a classified briefing there with a senator or a congressman, and they sit there really like kings, and they ask questions, and suppose this, suppose this. And very often, the information you're giving, and I participate in many of these, is much less detailed than what you could read in the New York Times, <laughs> <laughs> except for the fact that the congressmen usually don't have time to read the New York Times um, or to follow it all that closely. So um, I think what all, usually the first gambit is to say, we'll give you classified briefings. Mm -hmm. And then those people who get the classified briefings go on television and so say, I've been apprised of the threat. And, I think it's very dangerous, and um, <laughs> I would like more briefings <laughs> so I can go on television more and report more on these things. Um, and, and, so, and that takes out a huge chunk of those who might push for broader reporting requirements across the board. So it turns out that they don't actually want the lesser players in Congress to have these kinds of briefings. Um, they're happy to be briefed themselves, and the briefing level comes with your seniority. And frankly, being in Congress is not all that rewarding, so getting these briefings is one of the perks of the job. <laughs> I, I, I hope I'm not being sound cynical, but uh, <laughs> this is actually a kind of rosy version of this. <laughs> <laughs> For the other version, you know, see Kevin Spacey and John Goodman and others. <laughs> Um, so uh, one of the issues that it does come up is the question of the limitation on ground troops. Um, so the language is that there'd be no enduring offense, and I missed, I missed one word, ground, so no, no enduring offense of ground combat operations. Uh, Senator McCain has come out strongly against any limitation, even that language, um, on constitutional grounds. So I just wanted to read to you a quote uh, that he's made, but he seems to have made it in different places, and just get your uh, reflections on it. So he opposes that language and says, quote, to constrain the commander in chief under certain parameters, in my view, is a violation of the Constitution, which calls for the president of the United States to be commander in chief. It would be a terribly dangerous precedent if we were somehow curtailing the kind of operations he can engage in. So if you could just speak to that question about from your sense of the historical understanding of these relationships between uh, the Congress and the President when it comes to use of force? Well, everybody's here, uh, everybody here, I assume, is taking constitutional law. I mean, there's a big difference between unconstitutional on its face and unconstitutional as applied. So, you know, if Ryan were taken hostage and I'm President of the United States and I decide that if I send in Arnold Schwarzenegger, I could get him out, the governor of California, <laughs> I could get him out and Congress has some flat ban that inhibits my use of the commander in chief power to rescue him, I could argue it's unconstitutional as applied in that circumstance. But that doesn't mean the general limitation uh, is unconstitutional on its face. And, um, um, but this, by the way, is a third exception that leads to the wording, which is they want people for rescue operations. I mean, we've, seen the, we've seen the cost of people being held. Um, and then you know, being publicly executed and things like this. And in a number of the situations, there were failed rescue attempts. Uh, let me go back. Uh, this is a story that some of you know quite well. Uh, when the Iranian hostages were held at the embassy in Tehran for, um, I think it was 444 days, there was a failed rescue attempt. And the failure of that rescue attempt led to a dramatic upsurge in special forces, or what is called SOCOM, Special Operations Command, where these uh, you know, really extraordinarily talented and able um, um, 
Navy SEALs and other groups learn how to do these operations. And these are the kind of people who did uh, Captain Phillips, uh, who did um, um, Osama bin Laden's case, et cetera. And they are now essentially on call to the different regional commanders for their most delicate operations. And it's become a huge um, uh, growth part. And so if the future of American military is uh, cyberspace special forces um, and um, drones, which do not involve enduring offensive combat operations, uh, you're going to see more and more calls uh, for these individuals to be doing very targeted missions. And I, I should say, I, you know, I was on many calls where, you know, the ex extremely impressive, um, especially if there's an extremely focused mission, they logistically figure out how to do it, they hope with the least possible risk, and sometimes it works. Now, most Democrats of my era live in the um, shadow of Black Hawk Down, where some of these very uh, groups uh, of special forces were nevertheless caught, leading to this huge slaughter. <coughs> um, and that has really pretty much uh, been the um, uh, the the specter that hangs over all ground force operations ever since then. Um, so I want to kind of lay out two different future scenarios. Um, just thinking through what might happen. One scenario is that Congress repeats what it's done in the past when the president came for authorization to use force against Syria and actually doesn't pass anything. Um, what do you think happens in that scenario, especially since um, several members of the Senate have in fact said that they don't believe that the president is authorized to use force against the Islamic State under the 2001 or 2002 AMF? Uh, Senator Tim Kaine's been probably one of the most eloquent and outspoken uh, people about this, but if he's left kind of holding the bag on having said that the president is not authorized under existing congressional statute, and this Congress doesn't pass a congressional authorization, there are other, num other members of Congress as well, other members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee made a similar stance. What then? Um, because in some sense, like the hard question asked of somebody like that is, do you think that the operation should stop um, if there is in fact no authority for them? Um, well, I think the technical legal answer under INS versus Chada is uh, if it's action outside the legislative branch and it's not voted for by a majority of both houses and signed by the president, it's not lawful and it, it's not effective. And so the remarks of an individual senator expressing their view on illegality won't be the enduring message of the episode. Um, which goes to the point which I made earlier, which is how much this has been tainted by the original decision not to go to Congress and get authorization. Once you start fighting this on the 2001 AOMF, it's very, very hard to go back. I think the scenario described, which is that the Republicans push for broader authorization, and then when the Democrats resist, they don't vote for anything, and that the de Democrats want more restrictions, and then the White House resists it, so they don't agree on anything. And they end up with nothing, and the president's fighting this on the 2001 AUMF, leaves him with a theory that doesn't promote the end of the forever war. And I think that that takes you to the end of this presidency, and then the question is, what does the next president do? Mm -hmm. um, so another uh, future scenario is, let's say we're beyond the horizon of actually ending the coming off of a permanent war footing in dealing with, at the very least, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, uh, bracketing, at least for the moment, the Islamic State. What does that world look like? Um, so when you testified in Congress, you said, in a certain sense, even if the time comes where it's appropriate to repeal the 2001 AUMF, uh, it doesn't leave us defenseless, is my understanding of what you had said. It doesn't leave us defenseless. Uh, the president still has the power to use drone strikes and targeted killings and the like uh, against terrorist threats that are of a continuing or imminent basis. Um, so under that scenario, it means that even if we uh, call the armed conflict with Al-Qaeda over because the core leadership has deteriorated to such a point that it's past the tipping point, 
the Taliban, um, for some reason or another, has reached an equilibrium with Kabul, and uh, there's some level of the armed conflict has, has ended. Your view is that at that stage, whoever's the president, might be President um, Lindsey Graham uh, or Ted Cruz, they still have the legal authority to use drone strikes against terrorists that constitute a continuing or imminent threat. Um, is that right? And then, when, and, and, and in that realm, and in international law, what, do you, what rules do you think kind of regulate that practice? Is human rights applicable there um, or not? So, so what, what's tremendously important is to appraise this in light of what are the political objectives of the administration on the ground. And there's a big difference between trying to protect American civilians and trying to protect a million American troops in the field. And both sides, but particularly President Obama, have very strong incentives to try to reduce the number of American soldiers in theaters of armed conflict. When you put a lot of troops into theaters of armed conflict, then you have to put in other people to protect them. And then force protection becomes a big rationale. So the surge, uh, written about it by Bob Woodward and others, actually created a tremendous amount of detentions and a tremendous amount of force protection concerns. So the real goal here is to actually not just end combat mission in Afghanistan, but actually get the number of troops there down to a minimum and get the number of American ground forces or troops in Iraq down to a minimum. And then suddenly you really are talking about essentially protecting people who might be the subject of terrorist attacks and then using the tools of counterterrorism against them. Now, you know, something like France, Charlie Hebdo, um, you know, they have a law enforcement system that can be invoked. You don't have to use a counterterrorism. That's quite different from obscure part, or, you know, isolated parts of Somalia or whatever. I think the problem, though, is, um, and, and this is what we saw with uh, Iraq, is in, in trying to strengthen an Iraqi state, uh, you know, Prime Minister Maliki uh, was not uh, a good leader. And as a result, um, uh, there became this huge ethnic divide. The Kurds split off. Uh, and the goals of setting up a strong enough Iraqi force that could defend itself against Al-Qaeda, ISIL, or anybody else failed. And then suddenly, we see that um, ISIL forces are seizing towns and doing things that armies do. And a big part of this was the fact that the uh, Obama administration, in dealing with the Maliki administration, was trying to do a drawdown of troops. And they wouldn't go along with leaving X numbers in, so they just pulled them out. And now there's a big blame game going on about this motivated by those who believe that the Obama, those particularly Republicans who believe the Obama administration prematurely pulled out the troops from um, Iraq. In Afghanistan, the obvious problem was that we put all the resources into Iraq under George W. Bush that should have been put into Afghanistan. And so by the time we finally got to Afghanistan, we didn't have enough resources Plus, it's not a great place anyway. So it's not clear what kind of commitment there would have made a difference. And therefore, the surges ended up having relatively uh, um, minimal effects. Richard Holbrook, the late extraordinary person, said to me pretty early, uh, if we end up with a situation in which uh, the Afghan government controls Kabul and the Taliban are controlling parts of the country, but there's enough openness with internet and other things that you can't have a return to the previous Taliban era. That's about as clean as it's going to get. Um, these are not winning scenarios. And um, I think that's what the administration is still fighting to get to, frankly. Um, what they want to avoid is more attacks on the, you know, you know, here in New York, uh, which I want to avoid also. Um, one of the kind of tough nuts to crack is uh, Guantanamo. Uh, and in your various speeches about how to enter the forever war, that's one of the primary areas that you're most interested in trying to solve. 
Um, so how do we kind of uh, deal with the legacy effect of Guantanamo? Obviously, under the Obama administration, the president has not sent a single new individual to Guantanamo. So the population is slowly dwindling. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's still this kind of category that's been deemed uh, too dangerous to release or transfer. Um, and some of them might not be able to be tried um, because the evidence against them might not be uh, presentable in a court. Uh, and, and what many people maybe don't know is that Congress has actually placed a statute that bars anybody from Guantanamo being transferred into the United States. So it's not just a President Obama problem. It's something that's shared by um, other, uh, the other political branch in, in DC. Uh, but how do, we, how do we deal with that? Um, what is the final way out of uh, the Guantanamo situation? So I think they close it ugly. And um, nobody's going to be happy about it, but end that episode. Uh, I first went to Guantanamo in 1991. My wife pointed out to me that um, since 1991, I worked on issues relating to Guantanamo for 19 birthdays since. So, you know, I'm sick of Guantanamo. But what it shows you is the failure, uh, and the, the, the making of initial errors are very hard to reverse. They never should have opened Guantanamo. The decision to open Guantanamo which have been cleared. I mean, there's, there's a tiny number of uh, Cuban refugees there now. On the windward, uh, on, on the, I, I can never remember Leward or windward side, but one of those sides. So the opening up for Al Qaeda detainees was madness. I mean, these guys were in Afghanistan. Why do you bring them to Cuba? Uh, you know. What was the scenario under which this made any sense, except for the possibility that that was a land without law? And then once it turns out that even the Supreme Court of the United States holds that it, it's not a land without law, there's absolutely no benefit to having them there at all, other than to have the most expensive prison facility ever created. Now, the president got off on the right start, and then other priorities kicked in, like health care. And he needed certain votes, and he you know, didn't put enough weight behind the commitment, and Congress got into the game and resisted. And now they're finally back at it. So one thing you have to say about this president is he goes back and gets issues that many people have given up on, like Guantanamo, and they start to move it again. So now they're now down to, what, 122. My own guess will be that this process will continue. Uh, we now have a new Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, who is a contemporary of mine in graduate school. I think he's committed. And they'll get it down to a certain number. And then the question is, what happens in the two and a half months before the president leaves office? And my guess is he will take them off and bring them to the United States somewhere. Now, many human rights groups are opposed to this because it brings indefinite detention on shore. Uh, I see that, and it's a problem. My own guess is, once they're here, it'll be very hard for them not to have more litigation, more things challenging, conditions of confinement. Um, you know, after all, Timothy McVeigh killed hundreds of people in Oklahoma City and was held in a supermax prison, tried and given due process of law, and there was absolutely no threat. So. Um, it, it ought to be equally clear here. Uh, I think that um, that process will continue. Will there be a group of people who, for whom there is this ugly fate? I'm sure. Um, by the way, the similar thing happened with the Marialitos. Uh, this is going to be one of the great banes of American existence, is this, these episodes. But better to end it than to perpetuate it or to leave Guantanamo open to be a future um, dumping ground, uh, or to encourage other countries to open their uh, Guantanamos. If I can just close on two thoughts on this. Number one is, um, when you go to the government, you often see that there's a fork in the road, but you're there after they went down the wrong fork. <laughs> 
And you don't have the freedom. In academia, you could say, see, the mistake was they went down the <laughs> wrong road. If only I had been there, they wouldn't have gone down the wrong road, and that shows the problem. The problem is in, if you're in the government, your job is to get them from the wrong road onto the right road. At which point, everybody who's looking at you, including all your friends from academia, are saying, you're still on that road. You're still on that road. <laughs> and the answer is, well, I'm sorry. We can't go back. We have to move forward. I'm going to try to get you there. And the second, as a consequence of that, there will be ugly outcomes. But I was very moved by something that Bob Carey, the president of the New School, said. You know, he was involved in this incident in Vietnam. Uh, people were saying that civilians were killed. And he said to the press, you know, everybody is not the worst thing they did in their life. I mean, by the way, this is a good message to apply to all those students here. We live in a culture where everybody is suddenly labeled the absolute worst thing they ever did. And that's all they can live with. In fact, for Bob Carey, I'm sure it was an impetus for him to do many good things. And uh, a little bit of generosity of spirit to people who make mistakes and not define them uh, by human error, which we all make, um, also applies to nations. And so I think that um, when you're in the diplomatic realm, you notice, and I, I see many uh, foreign LLMs are here, uh, everybody hates America, but everybody loves Americans. <laughs> and um, everybody wants America to be good because there's no other place that can be good like America. I mean, when President Obama was elected, I was at a diplomatic meeting, and the number of people came up to me and said, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. You, you just elected this African-American guy president. This would never happen in our country. You know, that's why we still look to America. Like a week later, they're saying, he's just like Bush. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, this is, in a way, this is good. Hold America to its own extremely high standards. Um, and America will never meet them, but it will always be striving. But as Lincoln said, you know, they're better angels of our national nature, so let's be asked to try to reach for those rather than the worst angels. But I wouldn't necessarily judge, I don't judge us by the treatment of the Marialitos. Mm. It was a horrible experience. I don't necessarily judge us by what happens to the last 50 people on Guantanamo and what was an inherited mess. Um, one more question, then I'm just going to open up to Q&A, so if anybody has questions on their mind, uh, is the question of Syria. Uh, so, and under international law, it seems very clear that the United States can use force inside Iraq because Iraq has invited um, as the United States and other countries to do so. And we are there with uh, Australia, France, Britain, um, Netherlands uh, now as well, and others. But in Syria, we're not. Um, and in Syria, none of those states have joined us, and except for Britain, the other states have actually basically said that they can't because it's uh, highly questionable under international law to be going into Syria on the theory that Ambassador Power submitted to the UN in her letter, which is if Syria is unwilling or unable to deal, to quell a terrorist threat from ISIL, then the United States goes in, either under, on the back of collective self-defense of Iraq or on uh, the back of self-defense of the United States. Uh, but obviously that's not getting as much traction with our natural allies. Um, and then you've written about this in part saying that, one, one quote from you is, an argument based on individual or collective self-defense argument is not robust or durable enough in the longer term to sustain the president's ambitious stated goal of destroying ISIL, uh, particularly, in, particularly in Syria. Um, how, do you, how do you see that uh, with the, uh, the proposal that's now uh, has now headed to Congress. Um, is this uh, is the mission accomplished moment for the authorization containing um, ISIL in Syria, or is mission accomplished destroying Syria, uh, destroying ISIL, which means that we have to it, it, it involves something about use of force inside Syria, and, and how does that exactly work if we don't have the international architecture to sustain that kind of a political and military offensive? So the rhetoric is. Uh, degrade and destroy ISIL 
the reality is just uh, degrade and defeat ISIL, and probably the operational code is degrade and contain ISIL, or return ISIL to ISIS, namely drive them out of Iraq and back into Syria, which is a country which is already in a state of total chaos, and so um, it's hard to see how you could make it much worse. The complication has been that the opening premise, which is Assad must go, uh, gets more and more relaxed every day. It, it's, it, it is very close to a situation in which we are asserting that Assad is consenting to attacks on ISIL because it helps him, which is a further way of bolstering his own legitimacy. So this is a world in which there's a lot of uh, uh, dealing with the enemy of my enemy. Um, and, you know, but those people are not necessarily our friends. And so the long-term relationship with Assad here, uh, I think is, uh, the, the future of Syria is, is a horrible thing to contemplate. Um, I remember a briefing I got early in the government, a non-classified briefing. Um, in which uh, somebody was giving me a huge amount of information about Syria, and I didn't really understand it at all. And I finally said, you know, I'm just a professor, <clears throat> but can you give me estimates on three scenarios? One is a transition to some kind of coalition government that can sort of pacify the country and proceed forward. A third is a uh, fragmented country. And third is total chaos. And he said, oh, the first will never happen. <laughs> the chance of that is zero. The chance of the second is about 10%. The chance of total chaos is about 90%. And the real question is, how do we deal with the fallout of it? This was quite a, this was quite a while ago, too. It was pretty depressing. And he gave me a list of all of the different groups that are operating in Syria with all these different names and all these different affiliations. And uh, um, the thing that's really amazing is how, much, how many weapons people have. This is the part of Arab Spring that's not discussed, but we saw it in Libya often. You know, these, everybody is armed to the teeth, and not just with small weapons, with gigantic weapons. And, um, so people have huge destructive capability. And um, increasingly, uh, these are capable of being operated on platforms where somebody with a laptop and a Jeep. Uh, so, so for example, in Libya, one of the reasons why drones continue to be used is that they could destroy command and control. And then they could replicate command and control simply by putting a laptop on a Jeep and having another guy driving around retargeting their same equipment. And um, so I think that um, in Syria we face a very bleak situation. The only hope is some sort of revival of the Geneva process, which requires Russian cooperation. And uh, last time I checked, Putin's not being particularly cooperative. <laughs> Now I learned he has Asperger's, <laughs> so maybe there's now an, a medical explanation, but the, the, <laughs> uh, the, this is not an area in which we're looking to bright scenarios. And um, again, this comes back to the point about getting out of it ugly. Uh, those who, we're no longer even not letting the best be the enemy of the good. We're talking about letting the good be the enemy of the bearable and acceptable on many of these situations and just sort of live with this. I was very moved to read the New York Times the other day about how the 90s was the greatest era. Did you see this story? You know, I, I you know, in, as you get older, you, you hope that life just is gonna get better and better and then suddenly you realize the best period of time was the 90s when people were, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so I don't know what to make of that. <laughs> I'm still hoping for an uptick. Uh, but I'll tell you, in the 90s, the Red Sox had not won any <laughs> world championships. And now they have three. So anyway. Thanks.
Um, so we have time for questions, and there's a mic that's going around. Hello. Uh, thank you for this meeting. It's great. I, yeah, you, I, you look just like Luis Moreno Ocampo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, hi, Carl. How are you? No, it's, it's great you invite this, all of us to this meeting. It's fantastic. And listening to you, I understand you are working on very detailed issues, but your remarks, Harold, are very interesting because you are presenting we are going nowhere. All these plans is going nowhere, will be failure. Because basically, you say Maliki created a problem, and I'm sorry, Maliki was the creation of the same policy, now you are pl planning to go to the Congress. So my question is, I understand all these legal details, discussion, is tactics, discussion is fine. My problem is, you, both of you are probably the best, one of the best here, Jose Alvarez was here too. So the best professors here on international law in this country. Is it space to think in alternatives that to use of drones and just killing people because as Kerry said, you cannot kill all so fast. You say that, that's interesting. So do you have a space in this American Academy to think in alternatives? Because I will tell you, no one else will think on that. That's the problem. You are the leaders. Europeans are thinking in regionals. The South, Argentina, China, India, Africa, is anti-imperialist. They are not thinking in global ideas. So this place in particular is the place to think in global ideas. And that's why my question is, these young kids need a better future than the 90s. <laughs> so who will think that? Is there a space to think in alternatives, in something different than just go and throw weapons and kill people that is not working well? Well, it's a good question, and, and I agree. Uh, that should be the question. I think, um, so, so here are some elements of it. Um, number one, the empowered individual. Um, the sense of global identity that all of you have. Um, the fact that you rely less on government. All around the world, governments are worse than their people. Stunningly worse. And, but there's a huge amount of people-to-people -people engagement that begins at a very early age now. Um, you know, young kids are now communicating across borders. The irony is what they're doing is they're communicating about things that are not constructive. So the number of American kids who are playing war games with Korean kids, brilliantly. <laughs> but the number of actually using the internet to prevent actual wars from happening is far less. Now, part of this, I think, uh, Luis, is uh, a product of a couple things. The global economic downturn and what it's also led to in terms of extraordinary political division. And so I think as the economy turns around, uh, at least in the United States, there may be greater possibility for collaboration. I still believe the political leadership matters, and I think that it may well be that Obama ends up being more of a transitional president because he came in at a moment in which things were in such a crisis. Um, and uh, I do believe that Arab Spring was coming, and um, none of the solutions in any of the countries is going to be pretty, but there may be some sort of pillars of um, stability, and we can foster some of these. Um, I mean, there's a moment of opportunity in Saudi Arabia. There's a moment of opportunity in Jordan. There's a moment of opportunity in the United Arab Emirates. And the question is how to build upon these things. Um, now, I think the problem that we really face is, and this goes to a, a legal point, uh, the grand era of great international law making was after World War II, constitutions and institutions. Um, and there was another great era of national security lawmaking domestically here in the US after the Vietnam War. In the modern period, we can't ratify any treaty, even the most uh, uh, anodyne treaties, and we can't pass any laws. In fact, we can't even pass debt ceiling bills most of the time, which means that most, and by the way, technology is moving extraordinarily fast. 
So most of the legal rules are being developed through executive branch interpretation because this is an area which is non-justiciable. And I think that what the Obama administration tried to do and which I was a part of and which I very much give them credit for is there's a huge difference between trying to translate the spirit of the laws that exist into current situations, translate the rules of the Geneva Conventions to cyber war, than the alternative approach, which is to say there are black holes in which there is no law to be applied, in which human rights doesn't apply, which I think was the approach of the last administration. So I think creative interpretation and strengthening of new institutions. So Luis is obviously a pioneer in developing the International Criminal Court, how to make sure that that court succeeds um, and is a constructive force in this process. That, that's one of the challenges. So anyway, I, I remain uh, optimistic about what you all can do. Um, I mean, think about this. If a generation ago, you could sit on a park bench and open a computer and all the knowledge of the world comes into your lap, you know, you would be considered a god. <laughs> and you do that every day, you know. Here it is, Wikipedia. <laughs> so you have extraordinary power and capacities uh, that other people don't have. And the question is how to mobilize that. And very often you can get to awareness without outcome. We were talking about this in my class today. Everybody knows who Coney is now, but he's still at large. So the question is, how do you mobilize very broad scale awareness into collective action? Hi, thank you so much. This is a little bit building on that question, which is something I've been wondering is, how do you end a war when you're not sure who the other side is necessarily going to be? I don't know very much about this, but you know, I imagine like when you end a war with Japan, you sign something with Japan and they say, okay, we're done. We don't do this anymore. But in a conflict in which splinter groups can happen and there's not necessarily a, a chain of command that's going to listen, how do you say, okay, now we're done. In ideal scenario, we would sign something and then it would be over. But that doesn't seem to me what this conflict looks like. Well, um what Jay Johnson said and the tipping point is essentially when the senior leadership has been decimated, which is the term that they've been using. You know, if bin Laden is dead, Al Qaeda core doesn't have anyone to take instructions from. They're taking it from Zawahiri, but it's not clear exactly whether he has the same level of influence. But I think the key is that there's a critical mass that these groups require to be able to challenge states as opposed to doing attacks. So I, you know, the, the attack on 9-11 was an extremely sophisticated operation, and it was a result of multiple efforts. But if you look at what Al-Qaeda did over a decade, they tried in many forms. They attacked the Twin Towers several times, um, you know, Mumbai 7-7, cartridge bomb, shoe bomb, underwear bomb. Some of these were inept, but there was a concerted campaign over a period of time by a well-organized group. Very few groups attain that level of support without state sponsorship um, because it requires weapons, planning, et cetera. And uh, the real question is whether when a campaign reaches a certain level, you can have a coalition that actually announces that this is a group of people that can only be dealt with by military force. I mean, Al Qaeda has no, Al Qaeda, Osama bin Laden had no stateal aspirations. I mean, even the Islamic State calls itself a state, but, and, and has some sort of political aspiration. But bin Laden never said, I want to be the president of a country. He just wanted to kill civilians. And that was his raison d'etre. Now, I think what Ryan and I have been working with, with others on just security is in the old days, you declare war and against, uh, against an enemy, define who they are and fight them and hope you can defeat them because there's no other way to do it. And then if you defeat them and a new enemy comes up, you have a separate debate 
about whether it's a different challenge and to fight them. What we have both opposed is the notion that you just have a simple blanket authorization and then you just add names to the list. This has been on the table by some. The problem, in fact, it's also been the basis for the foreign terrorist organization law. There is never a situation from my time in the government where someone won't put somebody's name on the list. Why should you? You only get in trouble if the name's not on the list, <laughs> right? So, you know, if the Ryan Goodman family looks threatening to me and I can add them to the list, let's, why not? <laughs> um, as a result, it's a ratchet, always in favor of adding. And there is no more consultation because it's a no-brainer to just add names to the list and the Congress can claim to have authorized it without even knowing who these people are. So it is individualized specific authorization for each new circumstance that gives any sort of meaningful democratic content to uh, authorizations of use of force. So I think we have time for one more question. Um. I thought the sentiment that we shouldn't judge ourselves by the worst thing we ever did was a really beautiful one. But I would wonder if we shouldn't judge ourselves by how we deal and talk about the worst thing that we ever did. And I'm wondering specifically about the legacy of extraordinary rendition, especially because our allies have made reparations to individuals that were part of the rendition program. Do you see any avenues for accountability within the United States when it comes to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, time to do that. You know, the Canadians have done it, if you say. Um, I think this is an issue that's going to come up in the U.S. Universal Periodic Review. I mean, the problem is um, picking the people to whom you're actually going to pay the compensation, because this will get very carefully scrutinized. And paying of money, government money, requires congressional authority you know, appropriation, and that's very hard to do. I mean, the sentiment in Congress for paying anybody who is affiliated with uh, Al-Qaeda is zero, uh, and very few people want to defend that. So um, there are two parts. One is the political commitment to do something, and then the second is the instrumentality of actually getting these monies paid uh, that gives something more than um, but the first part of it, which is the symbolic part, is extremely meaningful. I mean, I, I worked for many years on a bunch of issues that surrounded you know, the, uh, the Japanese internees in World War II wanted an apology, wanted expungement of criminal charges, and wanted compensation. And this was a long campaign that took a huge period of time. And they ended up getting the compensation very often the compensation is nothing close to what they experienced. Um, so, but you know, a group will form around this set of issues and will continue to push it. And one good thing about the United States is our political system allows these groups to keep working on these issues for a very long period of time, even after it's been sort of defanged of the political uh, overtones of the events around which it occurred. So the further away you get from 9-11, I think the, the likelihood that, that there's going to be compensation for those who were really brutally treated goes up. Great. So thank you, uh, thank you very much. And please, everybody. Thank you.